welcome to All Right in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair. This podcast is a little different than our usual programs. Dr. Naomi Long Magid, the Detroit Poet Laureate, had been on our interview wish list for quite some time. Last fall, we tried to interview her here on the podcast about her latest book, You Are My Joy and Pain. That didn't work out, and sadly, a few weeks later, she passed away. Today, we'll be paying tribute to Magid's career as a poet, a publisher, and Poet Laureate from 2001 to 2020. We're talking with two people in the Detroit literary community about her work, her legacy, and how they will remember her. Our featured guests today are Lysia Duskin, a graphic designer, artist, and instructor who is a board member of Broadside Lotus Press and a longtime collaborator with Dr. Magid, and M.L. Liebler, an internationally known Detroit poet university professor, literary arts activist and arts organizer, and also the Poet Laureate for St. Clair Shores, Michigan. We'll start our tribute with Lucia Duskin. Irene, over to you. How did you meet Naomi Long Magic? I met Naomi Long Magic in 1982. I was uh, uh, new in college. I was cultivating writing there in college, really being inspired by the poets that I uh, met but particular Naomi for her concise, no, not concise, her classical um, effective writing style, so clear. And uh, it just really attracted me. And she was, you know, she was a person of note at that time. Um, I like the fact that um, as a writer, her writing, her work was very accessible. That's the word I'm looking for. And I was a writer more from feel. I wasn't particularly an, an English person per se. And she was, and that really drew my attention because I wanted that. I wanted to know more about the the backbones, the building of poetry in a more formal way. So I met her and she uh, knew of my graphics, uh, my graphic arts um, training. And from that point, she more or less uh, asked me to come along to join her with a uh, assisting with publishing the books and, and, and printing the books. What was she like to work with? Naomi was great to work with. Um, she asked me to assist her and I was new in the industry, but I was specializing in print right at that point. It was great working with her because not only did I find learn more about poetry, but I learned more about design and pagination and production. That's kind of what I was going into at that time. That was my focus. And it was a joy to work with her because while working with her, always an educator, always um, having a quick reference, her life, her timelines, how she had um, uh, grown up in, uh, uh, through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, we found uh, ourselves talking about her family history and, and the like. And the work just went smoothly because that was kind of the backdrop, the narrative of uh, our time together. And specifically, Naomi was a pioneer in using software and, and uh, application and software and hardware that was not being used much at the time. For example, she pioneered in using the Apple Mac computer uh, when they were first launching. That is to say, um, she had in her studio's uh, basement set up an Apple computer, a small printer. Um, I was going into that field. She would be the first one of my early exposures to using the Apple Mac. It was just really fantastic to work for her because she worked hard and she let everyone who worked with her or around her know in no uncertain terms that poetry was her passion, very much so. And therefore, you picked up on that and, you know, you worked as hard as she did and you felt the value in the work of publishing these poets through Broadside Lotus Press. She started Lotus Press in 1972 and served as publisher and editor 
until it merged with Broadside Press in 2015. What did she set out to achieve at Lotus Press? In a word, excellence in poetry. Um, Naomi being such a, an awesome poem poet herself, she inspired that in others. She was an excellent jurist, editor, and mentor for many poets. And it was her mission, her selfless mission, to promote Detroit poets and others. And let those poets know that their voice was valuable and affirm them and have them be able to have their works produced in a professional way, to have them have their works promoted in a professional manner. I would say that was that was a great deal of it. And she did this knowing that it was to some extent a sacrifice of her own work. But she wanted to, she looked at the broader picture of others, definitely. When she talked about her own work, what kinds of things did she say? Her own writing. Uh, Naomi's writing is such a broad scope, um, accessible, complex, all at the same time. Uh, it has a historical span from her many years. It uh, speaks to the civil rights movement. It speaks to her personal thoughts on love, emotion, places where she lived, traveled. Um, I think one of the things she talked about a lot to me is the force of poetry, that it had to come out. It needed to come out. She felt that her writing helped affirm poetry as a serious creative literature endeavor. Um, that is to say, she wanted to produce work that would inspire others writing poetry, and she was most proud of the press um, allowing other published poets to be published likewise. What did she like best about her roles as publisher and editor? Promoting good poetry, absolutely, absolutely. Um, she felt strongly that poetry should be produced well by way of broadsides, by way of poetry books. She felt that it should be well promoted and that poets be recognized in the uh, literary areas. She was mainly pleased and proud to uh, promote the expression of others. Again, that's where the selflessness comes in because uh, while she had her own work, she took a great joy in seeing others come through um, the um, stages and ranks of poetry. That's great. And she was po Detroit Poet Laureate as well. So what did she take from that role? Did she, you, take the same things, the enjoyment of supporting others? Yes, absolutely. Um, she didn't take it so much as something just celebrating her. She felt that through her, others would know, oh, poetry, wow, okay, you can actually be, um, have some notoriety for that. That is to say, others would look upon that. And for certain, it garnered her more exposure to provide lectures and discussion groups, workshops, and uh, speaking engagements, you know, uh, in Michigan and other parts of the country. She was very much enthusiastic to promote other authors. She knew that this, the achievement was hers, but she felt that that achievement would be a, a mirror affirmation to others. Um, she felt that it not only celebrated her work as a poet, but it made others aware of poetry. I specifically remember her saying that, and that it would inspire others. Um, and another practical aspect of her becoming a poet laureate is that it gave her an increased access to speak, uh, uh, provide mentoring, workshops at schools, high school and college. She most recently um, was involved in a uh, very nice uh, meeting with students. Um, that was the University of Michigan Hope Room in 2019. That was something she really liked and having that title of a poet laureate of Detroit, that helped facilitate that, which again took her back to assisting others and in affirming poetry in, uh, in others. Um, I think if there's one vain thing that I recall Naomi having was her license plate, Poet One. That's fantastic. Yeah, I said, you go, you get that plate, you get that license plate. and. It was, that was one of the few things that she did that was kind of, uh, you know, visible. But otherwise, she was very humbled and honored by the uh, award uh, given by then Dennis Archer. Very much so. 
Also joining us today is M.L. Liebler, an internationally known Detroit poet, university professor, literary arts activist, and arts organizer, who has also founded and directed many key literary organizations. Um, M.L., yes. in the early 2000s, you worked with Dr. Melba Joyce Boyd together on an anthology that featured Naomi Long Magid, uh, Abandoned Automobile, Detroit City Poetry 2001. Did you know her before that, or is that when you got to know her? No, I knew I knew her before that. Um, I had met her through another poet. I mean, I knew who she was, of course, but um, I met her through another poet who was a very good friend of hers, um, a poet from India, Salim Paradina, uh, Paradina. And he asked me to join her and her husband, uh, this is a long time ago, uh, for dinner. And that's when I really got to know her personally. And uh, at, from that point on, I don't remember what year. It must have been in the um, the eighties. Yeah, it had to be in the eighties. And and uh, I think Lucia is in the um, abandoned automobile, aren't you? Lucia? You know, I couldn't verify it. I wasn't sure. Uh, I have one downstairs, but I'm yeah. pretty sure that you were on the scene at that time for sure. I was. And that was the beginning of me meeting her and our, our lifelong friendship was, for me, it was 82. Yeah, so, so through, I was a couple of years. Ron Allen, all them. Yeah, I, I can't remember why we were having dinner at what is now that uh, the cafe at the, at the Majestic there. Right. The restaurant. Uh, so anyway, I met her and her husband and Salim. I don't know why we met, if we were all going to a reading or something. Uh, after or just just a dinner but that's when I got to know her and then I worked with her uh, and let's see you might remember this too remember when she had the anniversary for uh, for her press yes the 15th uh, uh, now I'm remembering a taste of poetry that was one of them and this uh, was at her church yeah oh. there were a couple yes and but, I helped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what happened is she called me. I was running the writer's voice at that point. And she called and mentioned that, um, you know, that she was having a hard time getting, well, funding together, of course. Uh, but she was bringing all the poets in. That's when I first met Herb Martin and all those guys, uh, of many of the people on her press. And, um, so I said, well, you know, that's not really a big problem. We'll just do it through the writer's voice and get everybody paid and get some plane tickets. And so we worked on that. Um, and, and I, you know, I was part of that. I mean, I was added. I don't think I was part of it. I was added, though, for the weekend. It seemed like it was a weekend of events. So uh, so that was another thing. In fact, that's where uh, that film about her, I remember that they interviewed me at that event or something in a side room. I haven't seen the movie in a while, but um, so that's that's my, and then we just remained friends and, uh, you know, she did readings and came to my classes. We used her book uh, a few times and, you know, always included her and she always was, you know, ready to do stuff. Yeah, Naomi would turn up at a, a, a poetry reading of 10 people or, 50 she right was, she was so much there you know and she was older at the time so i was like in my 20s so she would have been in her 50s and i'm like oh okay this is really cool and then when i heard her poetry i was like i really like this because i didn't have a formal background she did but yet it wasn't difficult poetry as some uh older poem or poems from the 19th century could be yet it was it still had that classic feel i just fell in love with it I fell in love it, with her work. No, and my students did too. And that's one of the things. I mean, she was very much an accessible poet mm -hmm. and a, um, you know, a poet that, you know, you didn't need a PhD to, to get what she was saying. But she still said it elegantly. Her last book, or the newest one, is really quite incredible. Um, the love and, poems. Yeah, yeah, it's really, I mean, I... Now, you know, I wish she was here. I would definitely have her come in and use that book. And uh, that because that's just a great, great book of poetry. 
Um, then there was when she, what year? I don't remember exactly the year. I'm thinking it was 2000 when she. Yeah, it had to be 2001 or something when she became poet laureate. Dennis Archer named her, and um, she she invited a bunch of us to the Manugian mansion for a big celebration that he was putting on. Uh, and he, him and his wife were great. And they were there and the poets, I imagine Ron Allen would have been there at that time. Uh, there was a good handful of us out in the backyard of the Manugian mansion. That was a very cool event too. I, I, I think I was remembering like, wow, I wonder, you know, what they're thinking about when they let all these poets in here. <laughs> How did Naomi Long Magic interact with the Detroit poetry community and with other Detroit poets? Uh, she was always willing to participate. She was definitely a, a, a poet of the people. You know, I mean, if someone like uh, Lucia said, if someone asked her to, to come to a class or do something, of course, that's the role of the poet laureate, but this goes back before that even. She did it. There was no airs about her um, thinking, well, I'm too famous. Well, she was, she was, she's really a legendary name. Uh, people all over. I remember doing a reading at the University of Kansas and the guy that was in the English department there came up to me and he said, you know, Naomi Long Magic, she's an old friend of mine. And uh, I'd like to see her again. And and uh, when I got back from there, this was 87. When I got back from there, uh, Naomi knew who I was talking about. And then uh, that guy came to Detroit. I think he had lunch with her or something uh, from from Lawrence, Kansas. Um, so she was always open to it. She did incredible stuff, especially as she was getting older. You would think like, you know, she might say, oh, forget it. But she that we did a thing not too long ago at the um at the uh detroit you know the dia during concert of colors they had an event around the confederate flag that john sims i don't know if you were there lucia but john sims who is a former detroiter and an artist he put together this whole project and he had singers, some well-known and so forth, do different versions, like a bluegrass version of Dixie. And I think it was called Dixie Reconstructed or something. And, um, and, and Naomi was one of them. And they, he had us read at this big event at the DIA on, in the film theater. Uh, Naomi came and, you know, I was thinking, oh, my God, is she going to stay for this? Because, you know, how poets are once they start reading, they can't shut up. Uh, this is uh, true. And, and she stayed. And then finally, and I thought, geez, that was little, probably 11 at night or something. She said to whoever drove her said, you know, I, I think I, I better go home. I'm thinking, oh, my God, <laughs> you stayed here from like seven until now, you know. I mean, I would have gone home if I could have, if I could have gotten out of there. But, uh, but I remember that I was thinking she had to be what she was 97 when she passed away. She had to be like 90, 93 at that point. Yeah. So like I was saying, she just read for U of M for one of their uh, reading groups, 2019. I accompanied oh, wow. her to that. You know, she was going less places alone, but she was still very, very active and I'm just, you know, so thankful to have been able to accompany her as a friend and assistant to some of those events. Because, again, it was so much that you could get from that, listening to um, her um, interact with those individuals. How would you describe her work? Well, her work is, it is deep on a poetry level. Um, I mean, it's sophisticated poetry, but it's accessible. As I was mentioning, you don't need a PhD to uh, read and understand her work. Now, that doesn't mean it's not, you know, deep enough. It is. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at it, where she takes it. But see, she also was something that poets in the 20th century are, you know, are not. Her Martin can be like this, too, is a formalist. I mean, she would rhyme, but she understood that it wasn't like just rhyming like in songs. It, there was measures, there was beats, there was, you know, 
uh, uh, feet and meter and all of that went into her work, which I'm always telling my students now is what poets did back then. So not only did they have their great ideas like we all do, but they had a work in a form and that's where the craft came in. And she was a craftsman for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, she was. She she knew that stuff. I wish I knew it like she does. I, I'm interested when I teach it. My students aren't, but uh, but I I'm more interested in it. And and uh, to know someone like Naomi who really took it seriously and and knew it. She studied it. She was a craftsman as well as you know uh, a free verse poet. What do you think other poets in the Detroit literary community can learn from her as an example, ML? Well, I think I learned it too, is, you know, if you're a poet laureate, as she was, um, your job is to be accessible to the community and to serve the community, whether it be children, um, you know, adults, library audiences, or senior citizens, or any place that asks you to come and um, do a program of some sort. Uh, I think she really, well, she did believe that. And she did do that. She lived what, she lived what, um, you, you know, she believed. And she thought, and there's a little clip from the movie that oh. Melba had sent me that I was showing my students uh, at, just after she passed away. It was like a seven minute clip where she talks about this and she said, you know, she talks about, well, I was, you know, I was in a lot of these anthologies that had this name, this name, this name. And then she said, and others, and I was the and others, but that was okay. Um, so she was, you know, she was just a very honest, open person. And I know people say these things after someone passes away, but this is true with her. She had a really long run as Detroit wow. Poet Laureate. I mean, what was her greatest impact in that position? What made what made her in that position different from what someone else might have done in the same position? Well, we'd only had one before that, uh, which was Dudley um, in Detroit. But the 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 idea of a poet laureate is um, of someone who is there to help the community um, when needed and when asked or, you know, if we ask them, uh, but to serve by reading, discussing, doing workshops with poetry. Um, you know, if you're really taking your poet, uh, poet laureate status seriously as she did, that's what you, that's what I think you need to do. Maybe I just thought that watching Naomi in particular. Um, you know, like if a school calls me, um, I'm, I'm the poet laureate in St. Clair Shores, but the school calls me or the senior center calls me, I don't say like, well, how much money do you have? And, uh, you know, how much time do you want from me? It's just like, okay, I'll be there. Just, just like this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'll be there. So what, anyway. do you think, what do you think it will take to fill her shoes? Oh, God. Oh, it's going to take a real special person who, if they're going to take it seriously, there's, there's some good choices of uh, people that will, you know, do what Naomi did and be as involved as she was. Melba Joyce Boyd is someone who has kind of risen to that level. Um, and, and, you know, maybe for her, uh, but there's, you know, there's not a lot, there's not a lot of people who are as, giving and into the spirit of of what a poet laureate is i mean but you know a lot of different people like nationally you know we've had poet laureates like we had one who just won the nobel prize but uh louise gluck who's a great poet i don't know her but she's a great poet but she's very private and very quiet and you know, I, I mean, I hardly noticed she was the poet laureate because she didn't do anything, you know, nothing against her, but she didn't go anywhere or do anything um, or give major programs or come at the beck and call. Now, Phil Levine was also one and he, you know, for the nation, 
And he approached it in a very populous way and instituted programs across the country to get poetry into schools and different places like that. Um, and then, you know, the first poet laureate ever was Robert Hayden, who's also from Detroit. He was incredible, too. It takes real commitment if you're going to be serious about it in the sense of what that position was uh, meant to be in any city, culture, state, country. I'm going to throw a question to both of you. What do you personally enjoy about her work? Again, that accessibility, there are, um, I work with teenage populations and outside of the lyrics that they hear in music, they would never consider poetry unless it had been brought to them in a way that Naomi would. As I said, she worked with high school students. She worked with Terry Blackhawk. Um, inside out organization. You know, I, I just think it's that, it's just that wonderful connection. ML, how about you? What did you personally enjoy about her work? Well, I liked how she dealt with, you know, kind of the everydayness of life um, yes. in her poetry. Um, she had a, a, a certain spiritual element to her poetry, too, that I really, really appreciated because I can relate to that. Um, and, 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 you know, you just knew she was like really, really smart. I think she had a PhD, but if she didn't, she certainly seemed like to me she did. So, yes, but she, uh, one, um, earned and two honorary, but I'm not quite sure. I know for sure there's the one earned and it might right. be two, it might be as many as two, um, honorary. The uh, content of the poetry was just excellent. And you would learn so much from it. I mean, her biography, even if you didn't know her, it would take you all the way through the period of 30s, 40s, 50s onward. It was um, very, very um, inspirational and affirming to read her, her biography and her poems as well, of course. Yeah, and a lot of times her poetry was biographical in that way. Mm -hmm. So so you got a little history lesson along the way uh, in a reading of hers. You got the beauty of the metaphor and images and so on. Uh, but then you got history in a lot of it, which, which was really interesting. Her story is amazing. Yeah, that speaks to her being a storyteller because a lot of times... You know, uh, someone might feel intimidated to read a long book on a historical subject, but yet she had a way of distilling a lot of facts in poems and in parts of her biography and just in conversations and her talks with teenagers and college students alike and uh, the general population. Well, I was just thinking, too, you know, she was a teacher. She taught uh, at all levels. I know she finished her career at Eastern Michigan University. But maybe that's the secret to uh, her success is to approach poetry as like an education or like mm -hmm. teaching. So you're able to pass along uh, information as well as, the, as art and the beauty of art. So pretty good stuff like that. And also I would say um, what I liked about her was it was innate in her to mentor people. She mentored me. I would have never oh. gone to do the book covers and pagination and layout to the level that I did had I not had my exposure to Lotus Press professionally, to Naomi as a mentor, and to her as my friend. She just, you know, that was that was her. It wasn't like something forced. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with that. Lucia, I know you came prepared with a couple of her poems to read today. Would you like to share them with us and with the audience? Yeah, I, I like that. Um, ML, do you have a couple of poems? Because I pulled out her book, one of her older books, Exits and Entrances, and I have Connected Islands. I, I would do something from the new book. Did you mention oh, the new book? Oh, that would be great. Yeah. No, I, that, that would be awesome. Okay. Well, so I have. Go um, ahead. Well, one of the things I really liked about Naomi is I. Um, grew to know her and our friendship uh, ensued. I grew older. She met me when I was 22. <laughs> and I really liked her spirit as her life uh, continued. And it really shows forth in the following poem, this poem being Attitude at 75. 
It was one of her favorites. And I will try to give it some justice here. <clears throat> this is from Connected Islands, Collect <clears throat> Connected Islands, New and Selected Poems, 2004. Attitude at 75. In this recurring dream, I am Tina Turner, fleeing my wild wig at the world. Stop strutting across the stage on many skirted gams, ageless and untamed. Completely in command and belting out my song, What's Time Got to Do With It? <laughs> that sounds just like her. Yeah, I'm totally. Feel her spirit <laughs> with that. And then I have another one. I liked her poetry about the city. That was kind of my first muse, looking at things around me. And uh, so I was drawn to this particular poem. This is City Nights. And this is from exits and entrances and this book was published first edition 1978 uh second edition 86 city nights for gertrude and eddie my windows and doors are barred against the intrusion of thieves the neighbor's dogs howl in pain at the screech of sirens there is nothing you can tell me about the city i do not know on the porch it is cool after the high-pitched panic passes, the windows across the street gleam in the dark. There is a faint suggestion of moon shadow above the golden street light. The grandchildren are asleep upstairs and we are happy for their presence. The conversation comes around to Grandpa Henry, thrown into the Detroit River by an Indian woman seeking to save him from the sinking ship. Or was he the one who was the African prince employed to oversee the chain slave cargo, preventing their rebellion and for wards and for rewards set free? The family will never settle it. Somebody lost the history that had been so carefully preserved. Mm. Insurance rates are soaring. It is not safe to walk the streets at night. The news reports keep telling us things they need to say. The case is hopeless, but the porch is cool and quiet. The neighbors are dark and warm. The grandchildren are upstairs dreaming and we are happy mm. for their presence. It's beautiful. Thank you. That right there is a great example of the yes. person we're talking about. Yes. How it, there's, a you know, as I was saying, there's some history, a little bit, mm -hmm. family history. And then that touching, touching kind of conclusion. And then hope. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, my mother was um, fortunate to see um, Naomi read a few years before she passed away. And it was, it was very, very nice. She, she, she wasn't sure. I'm going to a poetry reading. I mean, my mother was literate and she was educated, but she still didn't know what she was in for. <laughs> And she didn't know if it was going to be some, some people doing some poetry that she really didn't have any interest in, uh, particularly it has had an open mat component. She just loved Naomi's work as well. Yeah, and that's uh, I think that's the, the key to going back to the other things we were talking about in questions. Uh, Naomi was a public poet. And people, uh, you know, of all types and all classes, uh, you know, can identify with someone who's uh, human, and she was extremely human, public poet. And yet she could, um, she was, she had the ability to apply a high rigor of uh, academic standards. Oh, or, yeah. Or child, I don't know if I'm saying it right, ML. She no, a, she, 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 she's, as an English professor, and as a lover of words and grammar and structure, she had that as well. Uh, and, and was just, like I said earlier, an excellent jurist and editor to be able to seek and have that sense of talent, see that talent and advance that talent through the efforts of Lotus Press. Absolutely. Were you going to well, do see, another one? Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm all set. I would like to um, hear what you, what you have, particularly from her new book. That would be awesome. 
All right, here's a here's a couple, and this new book is just extremely moving in many ways, and you can kind of see a career and life worth of poetry sort of all gathered in uh, in her book, in the new book. This one's called Arrival. Let me come into your days easily. Not as a strange knock at the door of a busy housewife or a bell's intrusion upon sleep. Let me just be there, like a pillow on the sofa, familiar and expected. Let me be something that always was and needs to be reassuring and necessary as sails and stars and harbors that are home. Yeah, see? Yep. That's, that's it. it. And I think it all is really, you know, she's bursting at the seams to release this poetry, you know, in her later years. And it's just beautiful. This is one called For You. How like a jasmine you bloom in my garden of remembrance. Daily you bless me with the fragrance of once love. Even in winter, April, small buds promise the casual touch of hands. Perhaps I will dream you tonight. It is there you will love me forever as perennial blossoms burgeon in ever renewing spring. Yeah, I love the references to nature too. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll fin I'm going to just, this is a short one, but in talking about nature, and uh, this is a perfect one in her new book called Next Spring. When I hear Robin singing that all relinquished things shall come again, and when bright April's golden promise comes to bloom, then shall I put aside my heart's accustomed yearning to know that soon my lover will be homeward turning. My heart shall bid farewell the ache of winter's gloom and say goodbye to cloudy skies and rain when I hear robins singing. And there you can hear her rhyming uh, structure and, and play clearly. Yeah, that makes me also think about the fact that she can write various forms of poetry, having um, studied from the mm -hmm. uh, greats. Um, yep. And she was willing to publish people's poetry. She was willing to publish various styles of poetry. Yeah, she was. Mm -hmm. When you think of her, or when you see her, or even an audience sees her, you see this kind of proper, well-dressed, um, intelligent, older woman, quite frankly. But she was so hip. She was so much hipper than, than what she appeared to be. And I think that comes out in her poetry, too, especially some of the stuff Lucia was reading with Tina Turner. That, that's totally her. But if you just saw her on the street, you wouldn't think that, you know. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, both of you, and, and paying tribute to Naomi Long Magic. We, we appreciate your participation and your memories and your appreciation of her. So thank you again for joining us. One thank thing you. that I wanted to add, if I could, the Naomi, um, as the press started to wind down, she approached retirement. She made a further commitment to continue to publish annually mm. a book called the Naomi Long Magic Poetry Award book. And that is going forth. Lotus Press has now been merged with Broadside, becoming Broadside Lotus Press. That was a, a wonderful um, agreement made between um, Naomi Long Magic and Dr. Naomi Long Magic and Dr. Gloria House. And uh, every year, a, a book is published again, seeking that excellence, seeking that um, talent in that 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 poet so that they could be affirmed and have their work professionally published and promoted. So that, that goes on in her name this yeah. uh, upcoming year. We have a book coming forth. That's fantastic. Excellent. We'd love to talk to the people involved with that too. We'll look forward to more information about that book as well. So again, thank you, Lucia Duskin and ML Liebler. We appreciate um, your joining us on the podcast today. Thank, thank you. you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Me. Thank you. Thanks. 
Listeners who would like to know more about Dr. Naomi Longmadget's career can find biographies on broadsidelotuspress.org, at poets.org, and also a more recent version at a link in our show notes. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts, or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.